It seems only like a short time ago I was speaking to you. Um, so what we're going to do, um, as Jeff was saying, is I'll, I'm going to present um, something, and then I'll make sure that we leave plenty of time at the end for you to um, come forward and ask your questions or text them to, uh, to Japheth. Now, the, the title uh, that I was asked to uh, speak around was this one, how to read the First Testament, or how to read the Old Testament, but First Testament is more positive, how to read the First Testament for yourself. And I, I pondered uh, that title for a little while, and I made the wise decision that I was not going to ask Japheth to clarify any further uh, what he wanted me to do, because uh, with this title, we can, go, we can go in many different directions, and we can talk about many different things. So what I've chosen to do is to look at just a select few um, items, uh, but enough, I hope, that will provide um, a context for us to address this, how to read the First Testament for yourself. Now, it's true that many people, when they come to the First Testament, when they open the Old Testament, it seems that they've entered a strange world. Um, well, once you get beyond Psalm 23 and passages like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But there are parts of the Old Testament which strike us as being strange, and we're not really quite sure how to understand parts of it, perhaps. So, before I spend some time talking about what to read in the First Testament, I'd like to address the question of how to read. In fact, most of what I'm going to say is going to be on how to read the First Testament, and then I have some brief suggestions at the end as to what might be helpful to read uh, to begin with. Because I think that if we can pick up on how to read, to understand the, uh, the Old Testament in its own terms, then we'll begin to understand more as to why it's written in the way in which it is written. So in order to, first of all, let's uh, you know, demystify the Old Testament a little bit, um, it helps enormously if we remember that the First Testament was not written in Boulder, Colorado yesterday. Now, that may seem like a silly thing to say, but often when we go to Scripture, we want to read and then get immediate transference to our situation. But the Old Testament was written many years ago in a completely different culture, in a completely different language than the one most of us have as our mother tongue. So if we can understand, first of all, Hebrew culture, how did that culture operate? And if we can understand how Hebrews wrote, what are the characteristics of Hebrew literature? Now, of course, Hebrew culture is expressed through Hebrew literature. We get insight into the culture through the literature that we have in, in the First Testament. If we can do that, then I believe that light can be shed in what at first might appear to be rather dark corners of the Bible. I think we can do that. Now, the first thing that strikes, which I think we should consider as we approach the First Testament in terms of its style, is to remember this, that there is a great deal of exaggeration in the Old Testament. Now, let, let me try to explain. Um, unless you haven't discovered so far, but I'm an Englishman. And as an Englishman, I have been raised in a culture that prizes understatement. So, if I read, uh, if I've read a, an essay by a student, and if I think this probably, with a little bit of tweaking, deserves publishing, I will write at the bottom, not bad. <laughs> that double negative in a culture which prizes understatement means that that student goes home to his or her family, kills the fatted calf, calls in the neighbors, and they say, Turner told me it was not bad. Because to go beyond that would seem rather unseemly in, in an English culture. 
of understatement. That's one of the times when I come to the United States occasionally, that's what takes me aback. It, it, it does wonders for my ego, you know, when I shake hands with the saints at the church door and somebody says, hey man, that was awesome. And I, I thought, did I, did I miss the burning bush? You know, was, was Sinai quaking? Um, because I think it would be true to say that in general, as an Englishman, I come from a culture which values understatement. As Americans, you tend to do a little bit more of what seems to me to be a little bit more of overstatement. But let me tell you, you ain't seen nothing yet uh, when you come to the Hebrews, because the Hebrews have a culture which delights in exaggeration, in deliberate exaggeration for uh, impact. Um, hyperbole. Now, let me try to illustrate it this way. If a uh, young, young Hebrew woman were to say to her true love, do you love me? Do you really care for me? Her Hebrew boyfriend or husband would say this. Oh, how beautiful you are, my love. How very beautiful. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats moving from the slopes of Gilead. Um, your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing, all of which bear twins, and not one among them is bereaved. Your lips are like a crimson thread, and your mouth is lovely. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David built in courses. On it hang a thousand bucklers, all of them shields of warriors. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that feed among the lilies. Until the day breathes and the shadows flee, I will hasten to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. I'll stop there. Now, <laughs> now you see, if, if that same uh, young lady had had uh, an English boyfriend, he would have replied, you're not bad, I suppose. <laughs> see, there's understatement and overstatement. Now, the rhetoric of love from the Hebrews uses exaggeration. We all recognize it's exaggeration, it's overstatement. You can take a 50, 60, 75% discount on that because we all know within that culture that it's exaggeration. But we get a problem when we read, for example, the rhetoric of judgment in the Old Testament, okay? Now, let's look at, let's look at one of those passages. This comes from Ezekiel 35, one to six. The word of the Lord came to me, mortal, set your face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it and say to it, thus says the Lord God, I am against you, Mount Seir. I stretch out my hand against you to make you a desolation and a waste. I lay your towns in ruins. You shall become a desolation and you shall know that I am the Lord because you cherished an ancient enmity and gave over the people of Israel to the power of the sword at the time of their calamity, at the time of their final punishment. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, I will prepare you for blood and blood shall pursue you. Since you did not hate bloodshed, bloodshed shall pursue you. And we say, oh, steady on. It's a bit rough, isn't it? But you see, as an Englishman, I feel like saying that to the fellow who's talking about his true love. I say, steady on. You know, it's, it's only a girlfriend, you know. Isn't it? Um, now, you see, with the rhetoric of love, we can, I think, easily make the adjustment and say, yes, when these people are talking about love, they go overboard. What we've got to recognize is that when they, go, when they talk about judgment, they also go overboard. And if we're going to give 75 or 80% discount on the rhetoric of love, we need to give the same amount of discount on the rhetoric of judgment. Do you follow me? Because if an Englishman sent, said this, you know, they'd call in the psychiatrist and, and, and take him somewhere, all right? Um, now, to us, it seems very harsh. But it's exaggeration, it's hyperbole, just as that rhetoric of love was the use of deliberate exaggeration and a hyperbole. So when you're reading the First Testament, take that into account. 
things are going to be said more forthrightly, more directly, and in a more extreme manner than we do in our Western culture. Apply the discount when you're reading it. Secondly, the thing to bear in mind, I'd say, when reading the First Testament is the whole idea of divine responsibility. And um, we, in the modern West, can think in terms of uh, degrees of responsibility, you know, more responsible or less responsible. I think in both American and uh, United Kingdom law allows for, for diminished responsibility where we know that a person has done something, but because of certain circumstances, uh, they have less responsibility for their action than they would have in, in normal circumstances. And one of the questions that arises when reading the First Testament is, is God responsible for that, or is King David responsible for that, or somebody else responsible for it? Now, this is where we have to try to enter a different world, but the Hebrews conceived of God's involvement in the world along these lines. Um, yes, let me ask the question. Is there only one God? The answer would be... Yes. Good, good, because I'm writing a report when I get back, and I just want to make sure that everything here is kosher as it should be. Yes, since there is only one, this is how the Hebrews thought, since there is only one God and He is Lord of all, right? Then ultimate responsibility, ultimate responsibility rests with God. The buck stops with God. For if there is only one God and if He is Lord of all, then in one sense then, ultimate responsibility rests with God. And that helps to explain some odd passages in the First Testament. Let's look at this one. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1, there's the account of David uh, taking a census. And uh, we read here, again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them saying, go count the people of Israel and Judah. So, who tells David to take the census? Well, it's the Lord. He incited David and saying, go count, so the Lord. Now, in First Chronicles chapter 21, the same incident is referred to. And there it says, Satan stood up against Israel and incited David to count the people of Israel. Now, you probably don't need advanced degrees in theology to notice a slight difference between saying God did something and Satan did something. But to the Hebrew mind, there's only one God. He is the Lord of all. Thus, ultimately, God is involved in this. What Chronicles does is to point out there is... That's not the... The whole story. There's an intermediary here. Satan is involved. Um, let's just hold that there for a moment. Um, but this, while it's to us, we say, big problem. Which one's right? Ah. Uh, well, no, the Hebrew said, well, it's, and we'll come back to this later on. Well, it's like this. But you know, it's also maybe like that. Another classic example of this comes in the story of the Ten Plagues, where in, uh, we're looking at three consecutive verses from the book of Exodus, all right? Three consecutive verses. In Exodus 9, verse 34, we read, When Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned once more and hardened his heart, he and his officials. That's clear. Pharaoh hardened his own heart, right? The next verse just gives us a neutral statement, 935. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he would not let his, the Israelites go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. And the next verse says, The Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his officials, in order that I may show these signs of mine among them. 
So, and you get these three kinds of statements running through the story of the 10 plagues. Some say Pharaoh hardened his heart. Others say that the Lord, that God hardened his heart. And others just neutrally, his heart was hardened. Now, modern Western mind think, big problem, this is really confusing. I mean, who does the hardening then? Is it Pharaoh? Is it God? Is it both or whatever? Well, to the Hebrew mind, um, this is less of a problem because there's only one God and ultimately what God does not um, if God allows it therefore in some sense God is responsible for it now we try to nuance that more but the Hebrew concept of divine responsibility has God more directly involved in the affairs of the world than is normally the case uh, in most people's minds today. So that's the reason. We might want to discuss that later. And then the third uh, element that we should uh, bear in mind, I'd say, is that the Old Testament works with a corporate worldview. And here we have a fundamentally different concept from what we have in our modern Western world. Our modern Western world is individualistic, whereas the Hebrew world is corporate. I read a little while ago, and I'm not sure if it's still true, but it was some time ago, that the most recorded song in history was the one made famous by Frank Sinatra, I Did It my way. That is, you might be interested to know, the most frequently requested song to be played at funerals in the United Kingdom at the present time, as the, as the uh, coffin uh, is taken out of the church to the tunes of I did it my way. If such a thing had happened in ancient Israel, they wouldn't be singing I did it my way, they would be singing we did it our way because they have a corporate view of life. And that helps us to understand some other, what apparently strange or harsh statements in the First Testament. Here's one that you know well, and I'm sure you've heard uh, a number of explanations of it, but it's from Exodus 20, from the Ten Commandments. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the first and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. By the way, did you notice some exaggeration towards the end of that statement? Thousandth generation, which if taken literally, of course, negates the point made before. Anyway. This has caused problems in many people's minds, and I think largely because we're thinking individualistically rather than understanding corporately. Punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me. For most of us, I think, when we think of sin, we think of it in individualistic terms. I am a sinner, I have sinned, I need to get forgiveness from God for my sin. But in ancient Israel, the basic building block of society was the extended family. And how many generations are there in an extended family? Well, I'm getting to know that myself because just a few weeks ago, uh, my wife Anne and I became great-grandparents. Now, I realize the look of shock on your face looking at me. How is it possible for this youthful fellow here to be a great-grandparent? But I know the number of generations that you have, um, as the ancient Israelites had, a, an extended family was typically three or four generations living together simultaneously. This was the building block of society. So when this, talk, when this text talks about third and fourth generation, three and four generations, it isn't talking about three, four generations of children yet unborn down the line who are going to be punished because of the sin of this person here. It's making this point, is that when we sin, 
My sin is not my private affair. It affects everybody. Everybody in my extended family, all of those three and four generations, it is not just your private business. Think of the impact it has on society, on family, and do away with that selfishness. Okay? So that's why thinking corporately enables us to think of what impact our sin has, not just on me, but on others. Um, right. Um, the fourth area, I'm going to come give a summary of this at the end, but the fourth area I'd like us to look at, and maybe the most important of all, is this. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew, and Hebrew thinking, Hebrew literature, but Hebrew thinking is not Greek thinking. And for those of us in the modern West, in Europe, North America, the impact of the classical way of thinking, of Greek thinking, has, it undergirds our system of education, the way in which we think and see the world. Uh, and that's why we say have difficulty sometimes understanding the Hebrew um, Old Testament, First Testament, because it's different. Greek thought and Hebrew thought are very different. Now, I recognize there are dangers in overplaying this and overestimating it, but there are nevertheless highly significant differences between the way in which Hebrews thought and Greeks thought. I'll just go through some basic ones here. So, Athens versus Jerusalem, Greek versus Hebrew. In Greek thought, um, Greek thought tends, tends to be uh, universal, it is timeless, uh, is concerns uh, with abstractions, is impersonal and analytical. In other words, just the kind of thinking, just the kind of language which is very helpful in doing something like philosophy or scientific inquiry. Greek thought is marvelous for engaging in that. But Hebrew thought differs. Hebrew thought, rather than being universal, is particular. Um, rather than being timeless, is time-bound. It isn't concerned with abstracts, abstractions, but expresses itself in, as concrete, concrete terms. Is not impersonal, but is personal, and is holistic. Now, the Greeks provided almost all of our abstract terms. The Greeks provided almost all of our abstract concepts. The Hebrews, none of them. If you look at a Hebrew lexicon, you find very few abstract terms, very few. Um, so when you uh, go to, uh, in the Hebrew Old Testament, when it comes to creation, for example, what the Old Testament gives us are concrete, specific stories about creation. But you can look from uh, Genesis right through to the end of the First Testament, and you won't discover any theoretical discussion of the basic elements of the universe. You get that from the Greeks. Theoretical discussion about the basic elements of the universe, the Greeks will give you that, but the Hebrews won't. But they'll give you stories of creation. Um, the Old Testament also gives us stories concerning kings and queens, the rulers of the land. But there's no theoretical discussion about monarchy, aristocracy, or democracy even. Now, of course, with the Greeks, there are theoretical discussions about all of those things. But all that the Hebrews give us are stories. And they say, you see what this king did? See what that queen did? Uh, what do you think of it? So it's, it's concrete, it's specific, it's time-bound, it's particular. It's not going to go to the places that Greek thought goes. And we might say, oh, that's a pity. But of course, the other side of the coin is that Greek thought 
rarely goes to the places that Hebrew thought goes to either. Um, and now, uh, something else to bear in mind. Reading Hebrew is not the same as reading Greek or English or Western languages. The mental processes that you have to go through in order to read the Hebrew text requires completely different skills than reading Greek. And this has a, a, a tremendous impact on the, the thought processes, the way in which literature is written and understood. So, if we take Greek and then from that we come down to other Western languages influenced by it, like, like English and so on. Um, if we take Greek, let's, let's stick with Greek. Uh, Greek has a very complex grammar. Um, if you ask uh, Japheth here, um, he'll, he'll take you through Greek grammar, I'm sure, and he will confirm that it, it is um, very complex. The complex grammar dictates how you are going to read, let's say, a particular sentence. When you look at a particular Greek word, say it's a noun, it will be in a particular case. It will be nominative, vocative, accusative, genitive, or dative. And you know that it's in that case because the form of that word tells you precisely what that word is. If you come to a verb, it has a precise verbal form. And so you know whether, the, if the verb is, is to sing or to run or whatever, is it in the present indicative active? Is it in the second aorist? Is it in the future passive? Very complex, but you know precisely. So you get a string of words, and as long as you know Greek grammar, you'll be able to read that sentence because the author has provided you with everything you need to understand the sentence. Are you with me? Well, some of you are, yes. Right, good. Now, with Hebrew, very, very different. Hebrew has a much simpler grammar. In fact, quite simple grammar. It's only got two tenses. Well, not really tenses as we think about them. In fact, so simple that I'll, I'll give you an exercise for you to, uh, to look at here. Originally, Hebrew well, the Hebrew Bible, as we have it, uh, was written without any vowels. Because, I mean, frankly, why do you need vowels? It just takes up extra space. So, uh, you, what you got in the Hebrew Bible was just consonants. Now, you just try to imagine, just for a moment, if the Bible that you had in front of you, every vowel was removed, and you had to read it. You've got a bit of a challenge, haven't you? Okay. So, the first thing when you come, when, when Hebrews were reading, they're coming to a sentence. The first thing to take into account is, what in the world is this word? You've got to decide that first. Let me give you, I hope you can see this. All right, what is this word? Now, of course, I've, I've been kind to you here because I've just given you a string of uh, consonants, but I have divided them into separate words. Originally, there were no divisions between words either. So no divisions between the words and no vowels, just a block, solid block of consonants. It's a very economic way of writing, as you can understand. <laughs> now, you come to that sequence of consonants and you have to read it. You know, you're doing the scripture reading next week, and you've got to read this. And you can't read it until you provide some vowels. But of course, there are a variety of words that you could get. So for each of these, I've given you some examples here, but possibly more. These are all the possibilities. So is that first word hot, heat, hate, hit, hat? Now, I'll, I'll just, what do you think that string of consonants is most likely to mean? Look, just using the um, examples that I've given you, some suggestions. What do you think I'm trying to say here? 
hit it on the head, and that's what you've done. You've hit it on the head. Right. However, you see, the reading process is quite different because the, the meaning is going to be affected by what came before and what came after. Whether the first word is hot, heat, hate, hit or hat depends on what's this whole thing talking about. So it's reading Hebrew is far more complex and whereas in reading Greek you, you read the words that are provided and you've got that sentence in front of you, in order to read Hebrew you have to take into account the whole context Otherwise, you'll have sequences of sentences which make no sense. Like, hit it on the head. Pastor Dolavira is preaching next Sabbath. The cost of a pound of mangoes is. You see what I mean? You've got to understand what the whole context is about. So, for the Hebrews, meaning is determined by context. So, let me give you a quotation here from uh, Jonathan Sachs. These different mental operations, serial processing, such as reading Greek or English, and holistic understanding, such as reading Hebrew, use different parts of the brain. Reading Greek isn't like reading Hebrew, and if we're going to read Hebrew texts as if they are Greek, but a big mistake. The left hemisphere tends to be linear, analytical, atomistic, and mechanical. It breaks things down into their component parts and deals with them in a linear, sequential way. The right brain, that is Hebrew, tends to be integrative and holistic. As in E.M. Forster's phrase, it sees things steadily and sees them whole. It gives an overview of a situation, while the left hemisphere focuses attention on specific details. Um, or some other things I could say here, but I see time is going. Now, it is possible to overemphasize this difference, but nevertheless, there are significant differences. As Sachs himself says, there was no Sophocles or Aristotle in Jerusalem. There was no Isaiah in Athens. And if we are in Jerusalem expecting to read Aristotle, we've made a big mistake. These texts don't operate in that way. We've got to enter a new world, holistic, imaginative, wonder, profundity expressed through narrative and poetry rather than scientific data presented to us. That's the Greek way. Very helpful in certain circumstances, but not for reading the Old Testament. Um, okay, let me... Um, to cut this short in... Okay. One of the big difference between Greeks and Hebrew thinking... Let me finish this and try and do it concisely. In general, what Greeks do, they look out at the world and they, they see this, they see that, they see the other, and they say, let's draw all of that together into a single synthesis, into a, a single theory that explains the various phenomena. We'll bring that together into one place. The Hebrews reverse that. They say, let's look at this single thing. And you know, it's like this. Oh, it's also like that. Ah. Well, I never. It's, it's also like the other. It's complex. That helps to explain some of the strange things we might read in, in the Old Testament. So, um, on fools and folly. In uh, Proverbs 20, uh, 26, uh, verse 4, Do not answer fools according to their folly, or you will be a fool yourself. You've all got that? Don't, do not answer fools according to their folly. And the next verse says, answer fools according to their folly, or they will be wise in their own eyes. Oh, come on. Do you answer a fool according to his folly, or do you not answer a fool according to his folly? Well, dear brothers and sisters, you see, uh, sometimes it's like this, and sometimes it's like that. 
because believe me, in the world there are all kinds of fools. <laughs> and how, what do I need in order to tell whether to apply the one on the left or the one on the right? What you need is wisdom. Wisdom. To know when it's the right thing to do this and when it's the right thing to do that because life can't be reduced to a single theory. And then, briefly, you know, you get this in, um, maybe uh, because of time, I'll, I'll just mention this. But in Genesis chapter 1, creation, what is the image that we get? And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God is transcendent, God is above, God speaks, and it happens. The next story, Genesis chapter 2, and God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now let me ask you, I hope this is not too personal a question, but when was the last time you were aware of somebody else's breath in your nostrils? I suspect the last time that you were aware of somebody else's breath in your nostrils, you were kissing them. We go from the transcendent God who speaks and it happens, to the personal God who gives the kiss of life to his creation. Well, come on, what is God? Is he like that or is... It's like this and it's also like that. The Greeks would bring it all together in a grand theory. And the Hebrews said, no, no, that's too theoretical. Let's keep the heart beating here with human interest. So, don't be upset when you come across things which appear. You read one thing and then you seem to read something which contradicts it. No, because in life, say the Hebrew Scriptures, sometimes it's like this and sometimes it's like that. And you keep reading and the Scripture will give you the wisdom to tell the difference. Um, so, uh, the things to bear in mind would be um, remember exaggeration, divine responsibility, corporate world view, and uh, how it differs from Greek and Western culture. And I think the Old Testament will become a little less, well, you'll be demystified to an extent.